Howdy everyone! You ever find yourself picking a movie at random and going into it with absolutely zero idea of what you've signed yourself up for? How about stumbling across a movie that, at best, looks like it could be, you know, only sort of okay, but ends up sucker punching you by being way better than you thought it'd be? If so, you probably already know how I felt after sitting down and watching the often chaotic, spontaneous Dharma preaching subject of this video. And if you do, feel free to name drop one such movie that you've happened to have this happen for you with in the past over in the comments. Something Wild is a 1986 action comedy, sort of screwball road trip other adjective film that was written by Eric Max Fire and directed by the late Jonathan Demme. In it, we follow Charlie Driggs, a yuppie financier that's played by Jeff Daniels after he meets Lulu, a carefree, vaguely punk alt-girl that's played by Melanie Griffith on an impromptu road trip. Despite making only $8 million against its $7 million budget, it got some fairly solid reviews back in the day, with guys like Siskel and Ebert both praising it on their show, Pauline Kael giving it a positive review in which she called it rough-edged and containing a sense of freedom in its footwork, and contemporary retrospectives continuing to hold it in relatively high regard. For example, in a 2020 article for Variety, Owen Gleiberman stated that he wouldn't hesitate to call it the most underrated film of the 80s. A statement that feels somewhat apt as a person who had never heard of this film before, despite its talent behind the camera, on camera, which includes a very random John Waters appearance, and a soundtrack that could literally pass for a Daily Driver playlist of mine. I mean, good god, this movie has the feelies, David Byrne, Oingo Boingo, Jimmy Cliff, and New Order on a single record. So in case you haven't noticed it yet, I really like this movie. I picked it up at complete random on Tubi one night, sat down expecting it to be a somewhat fluffy flick to put on while I folded laundry, and basically found myself texting everyone I know to check it out by the time I hit the 45 minute mark. I even immersed myself in everything I could pertaining to the film and bought the Criterion Blu-ray for it the second the credits rolled. Credits which, by the way, absolutely encapsulate everything there is to love about the film and deserve a brief cutaway. Look, I don't want to mislead anybody. Something Wild is not high art. It's not the best, deepest movie you're ever going to watch, and I wouldn't dare call it revolutionary. If you aren't familiar with the name Jonathan Demme, I'll even just come out and say the quiet part out loud, he's the guy who directed Silence of the Lambs, Philadelphia, the remake of The Manchurian Candidate, and the Talking Heads concert film Stop Making Sense. It's far from being his most iconic or high quality work. But Something Wild still has a clear place in his body of work because it helped bridge the first and second stages of his career. One that started with Roger Corman produced exploitation flicks and arguably peaked with Silence of the Lambs. It's also just a really fun movie. Like I mentioned a moment ago, I picked this out at complete random. I didn't know that Demi directed it, and I didn't know that its soundtrack was loaded with stuff that may as well have been curated for me. I just picked it and barely knew anything about the film outside of what I could glean from a preview clip on Tubi. It was, by every stretch of the word, a blind watch for me, and I probably walked away from this movie having enjoyed it more because of that. So today, I thought I'd chill out and gush about something wild for a bit. It's a movie that a lot of you probably haven't seen or even heard of before, but it's something that I think a lot of you would also enjoy. Additionally, I'm gonna keep the spoilers to as much of a minimum as I can afford to in this video, and I ask anyone who has seen the movie before to do the same over in the comments. The final stretch of this video exists as this form of almost encouragement for people to go blind watch more movies, so in the spirit of that, I just thought maybe keeping things a little vague would be helpful. Something Wild has a very low-key opening. Despite being a road trip movie that basically races out of Manhattan as fast as it can, it goes out of its way to show us a ton of B-roll from the city over its opening credits. And I can't help but feel like the message behind that is extremely simple. 
While the film doesn't really take place in New York, it is about people connecting and doing something impulsively. So by showing us the city and instilling us with a sense of comfort towards it and where our story begins, it's giving us some background information into who our characters are as well as instilling us with a sense of comfort that they may feel for this area before indulging in one of the film's many rug pulls and surprises. AKA the very thing that makes the movie such a joy to watch, even by its director's admission. It's what made it a great script to read, and I think part of what makes it a, an exciting movie to see is you never know what's going to happen next. Whatever you've been expecting might happen next on the basis of kind of the formulas we've gotten to, to know so well as moviegoers, something else was going to happen and it was going to be terrific. Our main characters, Charlie and Lulu, are New Yorkers. They dress like stereotypical New Yorkers from the era and act like them too. But as we quickly find out, there's a lot more to them than meets the eye. Lulu basically kidnaps Charlie in the first 10 minutes of the movie and drags him out of the city. It's a literal moment where she pulls him out of his comfort zone. Coincidentally, it's also the moment where we get pulled out of our comfort zone as an audience because any of our pretensions about what the movie may have been about suddenly get turned upside down. A simple meet cute turned into a low-key abduction. A low-key abduction turned into the seduction of a married man, etc. And before anyone tries to complain that I'm already breaking my avoiding spoilers rule from earlier, this was all just from the first 10 minutes of the movie. Like, this was all decidedly first real material, and something wild goes completely off the rails after this stuff happens. Even better, it has a reason for being this way. The film relishes in spontaneity while simultaneously doing the legwork to make sure that everything is intentional. Something wild never feels random. It feels wild, as the title implies. Every line, even something as small as a throwaway come on while Lulu is straddling Charlie in bed is a Chekhov's gun waiting to get fired. Charlie is a clearly repressed business type. The most exciting thing going on in his life is stiffing the odd check or stealing candy bars from grocery stores. He's the antithesis of Lulu, a free-spirited force of nature that finds herself drawn to him for reasons that aren't clear to us for most of the movie, but are repeatedly implied to potentially be tied to his earnest, compassionate way of interacting with people. Thanks, Rose, whether you put, you know, Mickey Stanley and... <laughs> what? What's so funny? You. What? what I do? I'm calling the waitress by her name. Well, that's what name tags are for. <laughs> there you go. Crap. Thanks, Rose. It just makes things a little friendlier, yeah, a little more personal. I like that. Uh, Charlie drinks. Yeah. The more we learn about Charlie, the more we can understand why a girl like Lulu might go for him. Likewise, the more we learn about Lulu, the more we can come to understand how she represents something far greater than a simple lay to Charlie. That's the beauty of writing characters that are seemingly so diametrically opposed to one another and then forcing them to be foils. Charlie and Lulu are inherently linked to each other and, as a result, have pretty classic screwball chemistry. The ways that Lulu and Charlie get to know each other is always the central focus of things. While we don't know the reason for everything they're doing as it happens, this makes every choice feel earned and like the only natural outcome that would have made sense. Of course, the somewhat milk toast Charlie is into Lulu. It doesn't take long for us to start to piece together that the guy is clearly going through some stuff and that he needs something to jumpstart his life again. So them crossing paths is akin to divine intervention. Lulu comes across as a post-punk spin on a flapper thanks to her bobbed hair and sexually liberated personality. She represents a sense of freedom that Charlie lacks and might be a little afraid of. <laughs> Despite their differences, we can tell that she's just the thing he needs to grow from as early as the scene where she handcuffs him to a motel bed. Which is, once again, only like 15 minutes into this thing. Likewise, it's safe to bet that Lulu needs Charlie for some similar reason. Perhaps because she's attracted to his normalcy, because it represents the type of reliability that she herself lacks or wants. Or maybe it's because, deep down, she's a bit more like Charlie than she wanted him to know, as represented by the way she reveals having a similarly colored head of hair partway into the film. While Charlie is the real star of this film, he also exists more as an audience surrogate because of the way he's thrust into a world he doesn't understand. 
He's our main character, but he also feels somewhat secondary to the film itself at points. Meanwhile, Lulu is a reasonably three-dimensional character in her own right. She admittedly leans into being a sort of proto-manic pixie dream girl pretty hard, but this is also somewhat subverted by the back half of the film. She can be read as being equal parts manic pixie archetype and femme fatale, but we're left trying to piece together which of those two character types she's more of at any moment, which makes her intriguing. Both of these characters ultimately want the same thing, the primordial human desire to drop their baggage and just get by. They just happen to have very different ideas of what getting by means, which naturally creates conflict and makes for great entertainment. Much as any good relationship is about two unique personalities commingling and learning how to take the best and worst each person has to offer in pursuit of something greater, Charlie and Lulu's character arcs center around balancing each other out. As the film often says, It's better to be a live dog than a dead lion. I felt the same way before. <laughs> Charlie needs to cut loose and live a little, while Lulu needs to, well, maybe not do that quite as much. Even the use of music backs this film's obsession with contrast up. The soundtrack repeatedly juxtaposes different sounds and tones to great effect, such as how one character can be heard listening to Oingo Boingo's Not My Slave, a song by an amazing band that's synonymous with combining the macabre with bouncy, danceable synths. It also uses the popular song Wild Thing as a de facto theme, playing several versions of it to smooth over and bridge each of the film's vastly different sections. Similarly, the band The Feelies are featured prominently in the second act, and some of their best stuff also happens to combine nervous, twitchy sounds with a high-energy tempo that would go on to influence the likes of early R.E.M. and 10,000 Maniacs. Also, and this is a tangent because they're from my neck of the woods in New Jersey and I love them, they're just cool as hell. And don't just take my word for it, Jonathan Demme was even a huge Feelies nerd if you don't believe me. When Charlie finally goes out of the dance floor with Lulu and they dance, to the feelies, by the way, my one of my favorite bands in the world. Speaking of Demi, let's shift gears to him in the production of this film. He agreed to make this after working on his 1984 feature Swing Shift, a movie that's sort of like the theatrical cut of Justice League and how it exists as a cautionary tale against studio interference. And while I'm not here to talk about that film in particular detail, I do highly recommend the British Film Institute's 2017 piece, Swing Shift, The Unmaking of a Masterpiece, if you're curious about it and want to learn more. It was actually posted under that title when Jonathan Demme died back in 2017, but was originally published as Swing Shift, A Tale of Hollywood in Sight and Sound's Winter 1990-1991 issue. So yeah, I mean, attributing it's kind of a mess. Basically, all you need to know is that the experience really messed with Demi and left him jaded towards filmmaking, to the point where he was even considering an early retirement from the game before he even got to work on what would become his most iconic film, Silence of the Lambs. But thankfully, he didn't retire. Instead, he stumbled upon the screenplay for this movie and decided to direct it for Orion Pictures, a studio that was more than happy to give him the creative control he needed to reaffirm his love of the craft after working on Swing Shift. And, and Orion was a studio that kind of said, we're financiers, we're not filmmakers. We're not gonna tell you how to make your movie. We're gonna finance it if we like the screenplay and if we trust you. And with that creative control, he was able to have an experience that he compared to getting to make a first film for the second time. Something Wild became a chance to kind of start all over again, and I felt in many ways that it was my, my first film. Much as new wave music emerged from the blueprint of punk and had a lighter tone that blended commercial conventions with a dash of the avant-garde and post-punk, he used this film to combine some of the more studio-style leanings he had developed prior to this project with the pure inclinations of a fresher filmmaker that was open to experimentation in the impromptu. To rephrase things in Beatles speak, he got back to where he once belonged. Take, for instance, one of the movie's most charming moments, which is when Charlie and Lulu are dancing and Charlie starts to ape one of the other couple's dance moves. That apparently wasn't scripted, but arose due to Demi trusting his actors and learning that the people that were hired to dance in the background were just good dancers. Even the expression that may as well be the film's logline, that it's better to be a live dog than a dead lion, is just straight up improv. The handyman was, was um, played by a guy who I had just met named Jim Roach. Jim's an artist and an art professor at FSU in Tallahassee where we shot the movie. But he comes and he said, could I say something to him? And I said, well, uh, uh, yes. And you can see Jeff Daniels in the movie. He's kind of like, <laughs> like that. And 
A second later, Jeff came running up and goes like, where do you find these people? This is amazing what's going on here. Parts of Something Wild feel like a student filmmaker getting a shot at the big leagues, and that openness to experimentation and letting the talent just, surprise surprise, be talented is an absolute thrill to watch. If I had to compare this to any other picture, I'd probably say that it's a lot like Martin Scorsese's After Hours. Just like with Something Wild, that film also follows a white collar yuppie from Manhattan as he impulsively seeks out some casual fun. Along the way, things spiral out of control and he's forced from situation to situation with little idea of what comes next for him. Not to mention, just like with Something Wild, After Hours was made at a time in which its director was a bit jaded with the filmmaking game, following some infamous production troubles Scorsese had while he was working on The Last Temptation of Christ. And ironically, Scorsese was even one of the directors that Something Wild's writer wanted to see direct the film. Managed to get an agent and he said to me, who would you like to see direct this? And I said, oh wow, well, um, gosh, uh, Martin Scorsese or uh, Jonathan Demme? To put things another way and return to that logline I mentioned one more time, directing both of those movies made Marty and Johnny want to become a live dog again. By cutting his budget down to $7 million versus the $15 million he had to shoot Swing Shift, Demi stripped the tools he had at his disposal down to the bare basics. In the interview he did for the film's 2011 Criterion release, he goes at length to explain how he isn't a fan of rehearsal or blocking his shots in advance. He was all about capturing the performance at its rawest and not getting tied down by ideas on how things should go on screen. So Tack and I got into this, this idea of like, we're gonna rehearse on film. Let's get the actors on the set. Let's find out how they wanna move around. Then Tack can light it. And then the actors can go get their makeup on and get their costumes on and come back. And now we can start rehearsing on film. It's a hell of a way to work. And while a lot of great directors wouldn't dare do that, here's looking at you, Richard Linklater, you really get the sense that it worked for Demi. I couldn't figure out if Something Wild was the first film he did this on, nor do I really think it matters, but I do think that it speaks volumes for how much he needed to make the movie this way after basically being Warner Brothers' whipping boy on Swing Shift. <laughs> God, it's always them, isn't it? Like, is it me or a four out of every five studio recut nightmare stories about Warner Brothers? You got Richard Donner's Superman 2, Swing Shift, Zack Snyder's Justice League, and... I'm sure there are probably several more of them, right? The Flash? Probably The Flash. They really seem to love screwing over directors of superhero movies. Additionally, it's not like he didn't plan some of the film's shots out. In the perfect example for what I was getting at when I said that he combined new wave punkishness with his more developed studio experience, Demi and his team extensively storyboarded the film's climax, which I'm not showing on screen because that would spoil the scene itself. Here's some footage of cats being goobers instead. He understood how important and load-bearing the scene was for the story, and how every shot had to be perfect so that he could accomplish what he was aiming for. So he did his homework and made sure to go in with a fully formed vision on how to do it. Demi knew that directing this film wasn't about abandoning commercial appeal or commercial forms of filmmaking. Something Wild works as well as it does because the director made a concentrated effort to cut loose when it would aid the story he was telling, then rely on more conventional forms of telling that story when that would work better. Because his main characters were a stiff yuppie and an impulsive punk, he understood that he could approach the material with both formal and informal techniques. His experience working on this film even kinda mirrors Charlie's adventure itself. The movie opens with Charlie being a fairly restrained man that's teeming with an unexpressed unhappiness towards his life. He meets the wild, seemingly unrestrained Lulu, who helps him loosen up, but doesn't change him as he's still ultimately himself at his core. Charlie just grows up a bit, and he uses his experiences over the course of the movie to become a better version of himself as opposed to a man living some semblance of a lie. He got his priorities straight and is able to go with the flow in a way that he couldn't when we first met him. So you know what you're doing? No. But what the hell, you know? Likewise, Demi was a jaded, unhappy creative after working on Swing Shift until he came across the screenplay and used it to loosen up and rediscover his love of directing. Interesting. I think the dynamic of a conventional businessman versus a wild card, angry person 
if not everybody, there's a lot of people that have those two components in them. Uh, and we're always looking to uh, corral the one that might get out of hand. Um, and I think somewhere in between, you know, if you can put those two components together, you get something interesting. Now, I know I'm making a few assumptions here, but it's hard not to when the director himself has explicitly stated some of these points. While Something Wild exists more as entertainment than a character piece, there is an unmistakable thematic through line to it that one can't help but apply to its creator. It doesn't encourage spontaneity so much as it pleads for it. Every major beat in this story exists because of a spontaneous choice, and we can infer that this may have been the case for its director. Even if the story wasn't explicitly a cathartic effort for him, it's so removed from pretense and was made with such an obvious uncut joy that it would be hard to believe that it's anything other than a labor of love. The movie feels less like a calculated piece of media at points than it does a scattered blast from a shotgun. We know that it isn't because, like I said earlier, so much of it is intentionally written, but that's how it feels. One moment, it's a sexual liberation road trip flick that's almost like a horny Planes, Trains, and Automobiles meets Bonnie and Clyde or a romantic comedy spin on Dumb and Dumber. The next, it recalls Peggy Sue got married a bit. Then, just when you've buckled up and you think you know where this is going, you realize you're only halfway into the movie and you're introduced to a guy who is basically Frank Booth from Blue Velvet meets Biff Tannen. Best of all, it pulls all these twists and turns off very convincingly. To quote the Chicago Tribune's review of the movie from back in 1986, it's not every day that someone goes Alfred Hitchcock one better, but in something wild, Jonathan Demme has done it. Goes might be a misprint of does, but hey, I pulled that off of an archived version of the review on the web. I'd check it against a proper scan of the article, but that would cost me like $8, and I honestly don't see any reason to do that. Look, I've said my piece on why this is a great flick. It's got some wonderful character-driven comedy, characters with unique screwball chemistry, as well as the goods to make good on those goods, and feels much shorter than it's just under two hours runtime makes you think it would, thanks to the myriad of tonal shifts and subversive storytelling laced throughout it. Something Wild has the audacity to throw ideas out with reckless abandon, and then move on from them with little regard for whether or not they stuck. For example, and this is a really minor thing in the movie that could in no way be considered a spoiler, there is an amazing set that Ray Liotta's character inhabits for like 20 seconds in the final film that is so freaking cool but literally only gets shown for one shot. Similarly, we're introduced to characters who impart sage wisdom on our leads but never come back or have any explanation for being there in the first place. And then there's John Waters, who's just there. Look. To say more about this movie would mean allowing myself to start getting too specific about it, and in the process, potentially oversell or ruin it for you. At the top of this video, I said that Something Wild was a blind watch for me that may have been unintentionally improved because of how little I knew about it. And now that I've talked about the film at least a little bit with you, I can explain what I meant by that. Which is that by watching the movie and knowing little to nothing about it, I was setting myself up for an experience that just so happened to be simpatico with the film's central theme of spontaneity. Hey, some people go on cross-country road trips with a punked up Melanie Griffith, and others potentially expose themselves to schlock on streaming services. I also like to live dangerously. Jokes aside, I genuinely believe that going into this movie blind was a great way to watch it, as well as that it's something that myself, and perhaps some of you folks watching this video, could stand to do a bit more with other movies. Something about this film thrives on not knowing its many twists and turns ahead of time, because when laid out in chronological order, they aren't actually that surprising. Part of the thrill I had watching this movie came from how expansive and action-heavy its plotting was. One can basically take each of the film's three acts and blow them up into their own movie. So much happens in each part of the film, and so much of it is so interesting that you wouldn't even need to change much in the way of their sequence of events for them to work as standalone stories. If anything, you would just need to extrapolate on a few details here and there to pad the runtime. And hell, if this were to get remade as a limited series for a streamer, you could even skip doing that and just break the movie up into three episodes. So, as a person who didn't know the film was deliberately written like this until after he saw it, I was genuinely caught off guard by it. 
I clicked on this movie thinking it was going to be a somewhat by the numbers romantic comedy road trip film, and then was surprised when it turned out to only kind of be that. One of my big issues when it comes to watching movies is that I have the nasty habit of looking at stuff like letterbox scores or IMDb ratings when I'm trying to pick what to watch. It's easier than ever to only watch so-called good movies, and the social mediafication of just about everything on the internet means that, regardless of whether or not you even want it to be, your taste in media has almost become a form of social currency. Even if you aren't doing this for the clout or whatever, it's still a very easy trap to fall into. A film's score is one of the first things you see when you Google it, so you don't even have to seek that grade out in order to be influenced by it. You could literally just be trying to figure out where you can watch the movie, and then BAM, you're hit with the news that it might not actually be worth your time. If I had googled something wild prior to watching it, I may have been turned away by its 6.9 on IMDb, or its 73 on Metacritic. I might have also been curious about the movie because it has over a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes, but I could have just as easily brushed it aside or let it get buried in my watch list in favor of picking another, more critically well-regarded and well-respected film from my backlog. This isn't me trying to shame people for wanting to make sure they spend their time watching movies that are actually worth it. There are a million movies out there, so I totally get it. Again, I do it myself. But I'm also introspective enough to know that I tend to get set in my ways and am a total creature of habit. If I go to the movies on a Sunday morning and have a pretty good time there, there's a really good chance that Sunday morning matinees just become my thing for the foreseeable future. Likewise, if I rely on IMDb scores to find out whether or not a movie is good before I watch it, then find myself reasonably agreeing with the score after I've finally seen it, there's a good chance that I'll keep doing that too. If anything, it's just human nature. I mean, this is a pretty simple dopamine feedback loop, and I'm a pretty simple human being with a lab rat-sized blind spot for easy dopamine. It tracks. So right about now, you may be asking why I'm bothering to tell you this. Well, it's because I don't think I'm the only person with this problem. As I just said, it's super easy to fall into this type of feedback loop, and deciding to break it by blind watching more movies is something that literally costs us nothing to do. It's as simple as scrolling through a streaming app and deciding to put Doc Hollywood or something on instead of something else, or going to the movies after hearing a few murmurs about a new film, but taking the conscious effort not to watch any trailers or read proper reviews of it. Like, yeah, you might not absolutely love the movie, but you can always turn it off or leave if so, or just chalk it up as an hour and a half of your life that you'll never get back. Plus, who knows? You might end up stumbling across the Something Wilds, or in the case of another seminal blind watch for me, Inceptions of the World, and be caught completely off guard by them. As the film itself makes clear time and time again, spontaneity is a good thing. Taking a chance on a random pizza place while you're on a road trip as opposed to waiting for the safe, reliable McDonald's you might pass in an hour is one of life's many pleasures, you know? And like, yeah, the stuff is peak, no shit Sherlock tier advice, but that doesn't really make it any less valid, nor does it change the fact that some of us probably needed to be reminded of it. Not everything has to be a life or death infidelity situation, nor do you have to rely on petty crime to add some color to your life. Sometimes it's just as simple as remembering to grant yourself a break from life's monotony. Anyway, that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you're so inclined that you decide to leave a like on the video, share it with a friend, or subscribe to the channel. Additionally, I hope you consider leaving a comment where you tell me a bit about your favorite blind watch or two. Engagement's a really easy way to give my lab rat sized brain dopamine, and I also just happen to really like learning about people's experiences with movies. Like, aside from whether or not a movie is good, I think it's really cool to hear about, like, the time you went and saw Shanghai Noon with your dad in theaters, or... The time you saw Norbit and didn't hate it because you were just laughing with your friends over how dumb it was or something. Also, if you're into podcasts, I highly recommend my podcast, Media Obscura, as well as its new offshoot, Glaring Admissions. Future episodes of both shows are going to be completely filmed and edited and uploaded to this channel as native videos, so if that's your sort of thing, definitely stay tuned for them. Additionally, there are 98 other episodes of Media Obscura that are available right now on its RSS feed. All you have to do is open your favorite podcast player and just search Media Obscura. 
You'll even be able to access every episode of Glaring Admissions once they get uploaded from that same feed. Or you could just straight up access the feed from your favorite podcast player by following the link in the description. Last but not least, I wrote a book. It's called Guppy Falls, and it is a self-published, friends-to-lover, coming-of-age story set in the early 2010s. It's sort of like the perks of being a wallflower meets American Graffiti and a John Hughes movie. And yeah, if you want to check it out, it's on Amazon as well as free on Kindle Unlimited. So yeah, bye.